Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just show of hands, who's here because this is a, a presentation about race cars? And who's here because it's potentially about additive manufacturing? I presume the rest of you haven't decided yet. So, uh, as Jim said, uh, KW Motorsport and KW Special Projects will feature in, in this presentation. I own both those companies. KW Motorsport was established uh, primarily to design race cars. That's my background. As a mechanical engineer, when I graduated, I uh, worked for Reynard Motorsport designing race cars for Le Mans and British Touring Cars. And when that business went uh, bust in 2002, I set up KW Motorsport. And uh, we've been designing Le Mans cars since in that business. KW Special Projects was set up in 2012 when we found that a high proportion of the work we were doing in engineering was not actually in a motorsport field, but used a lot of the technology and, and uh, materials and, and transfer of those technology and materials into other sectors. In particular, uh, high performance engineering, such as professional sports, uh, automotive, uh, automotive with a non-motorsport back um, pedigree, and also in the area which is uh, um, relevant today to digital manufacturing. So we got uh, very heavily involved in digital manufacturing through the direct transfer of technology from motorsport into that sector. So for those of you that don't aren't familiar with Le Mans Racing, I'm just going to show a short um, video from Stracker Racing, who are our customer and partner on this project. You can see their car out at the entrance of the uh, exhibition here. Stracker and KW Motorsport uh, collaborated on this project, heavily involving advanced um, manufacturing and digital manufacturing in order to meet some pretty, pretty stringent timescales. But I'll show you a short video that Stracker produced at uh, Silverstone testing for Le Mans this year. And whilst this video is showing, I'll, uh, I'll give you a couple of facts about Le Mans that might be interesting. So Le Mans is conducted over a 24-hour race in June every year. The cars that race compete uh, in over, well, they complete over 5,300 kilometers, which is as much as any F1 car will do in a whole season of 18 races. So this is 24 hours non-stop. The race is often uh, won or lost, depending on how much time is spent in the pits. It's reliability that is key. It is a 24-hour sprint these days, um, no longer a, a, a pure endurance race. It's, uh, to give you an idea, Porsche, uh, who won the race this year, spent only 29 minutes and 42 seconds in the pits over a 24-hour event. And that was 30 pit stops, so 30 pit stops, 10 of those pit stops involved driver changes, which you see happening here in this uh, pit stop. A driver change, you change tires, fuel, and the driver. And changing the driver is quite a difficult thing. You'll notice these cars are closed cockpit, unlike an F1 car. Getting the driver in and out safely is important. You'll notice the door mechanisms need to function well. They also have to stay in place whilst the car's racing. And they also provide a lot of the, he the head protection equipment for the driver. So it's a pretty important part of the structure. Le Mans is 13 kilometers long, I think 13.6 kilometers. And I think the quickest pit stop that uh, Porsche had this year with, without changing tires and driver was 51 seconds. So often it is won or lost on how quickly you can do a driver change. So the project that we embarked on with Stracker was to design and manufacture and implement on the race car before a critical homologation date, a complete driver safety and door protection system. We had a very tight time scale, eight weeks, nine weeks. If you look at the dates there, uh, 22nd of December start date was, was um, fairly important because that's pretty close to Christmas and New Year. So of the eight or nine weeks that we had to, to design, manufacture, and install this on the race car before homologation, we already were facing uh, two weeks of disruption through the Christmas period. So the success of this product was clearly gonna be defined by uh, the amount of design time we had available, and we had to compress, therefore, the amount of manufacturing time we had available and mitigate the risks of that process so that when we did come to do the installation of the doors onto the race car, it worked. It had to work first time, and we had to pass the homologation tests. The only way we could achieve that in any other traditional way, as uh, was mentioned in some previous presentations, was a traditional design route of design, make, test, design, make, test, and repeat until you get the product absolutely right. You, you pass your tests uh, based on, on your um, design studies at the beginning. If they don't pass, you make new parts. 
So to reduce that process, we did all of our simulation uh, at the beginning of the design. We, exp we expanded the design process and reduced the manufacturing time and also had a little bit of overlap in the middle. And we did that using additive manufacturing as one of our key processes. So minimizing, minimizing manufacturing lead time, mitigating risks. And key to that is digital manufacturing. Not just 3D printing or additive manufacturing. This is where I, I am very passionate about the process. It's, it's what's really key, and Phil was talking about it earlier in his presentation, what's really key to driving this 3D printing revolution, the additive manufacturing revolution, is not the printers, not the machines. They've been around 10, 20 years. It's the digital software behind it. It's the software we now use to design parts, validate parts, simulate parts, and, uh, and use that digital data for manufacturing. So we're very, very uh, passionate about the fact, and, and it's, it's the bit that we rant about, and the bit I've written several articles about. It's not 3D printing, and it's not additive manufacturing. It's the whole process, digital manufacturing. And that's, that's what KW Special Projects it was set up to do. It's to deliver those solutions. And we, we actually design and build machines for other sectors in composites, in uh, medical, in aerospace, where we're actually exploiting net shape manufacturing, digital manufacturing from software, minimizing tooling, and uh, streamlining the manufacturing process. So that aside, that's what we used for, for solving the problem we had now with the Stracker race car. So we started with a CAD model. The CAD model is our digital asset. That's the bit that we use all downstream of the process. The more we invest in the CAD model, the more we can do later on in the process, whether it's manufacturing, simulation, making tooling, or um, CFD, so computational fluid dynamics, or finite element analysis. We must invest heavily in that digital asset at the beginning. If we haven't got it as CAD data from a customer or through something we've designed from scratch, we can create it by reverse engineering by using scanning. So we talked about special projects. That's just to prove it's not all about me. There is somebody else in the business. Stuart Banyard runs our additive manufacturing department and advanced manufacturing in general. We have a suite of three Fortis, uh, Stratasys Fortis 400 FDM machines. We're not a print bureau. We use those for our projects. They are part of what we do. Uh, we use them as part. Our, our engineers now know that those assets are there, um, ready to use to help, help them streamline their process. And we use them for uh, the Le Mans cars. We also do uh, probably make about 1,000, 1,500 parts a year for Formula One using these machines. So the first job that Stuart had to do once we'd invested in our digital asset and created the CAD model was we, we're going to mitigate our risk by building a prototype. This is the traditional use of additive manufacturing. Uh, we used it so that we knew that what we were going to make ultimately was going to fit the, uh, the race car in question and also worked kinematically. So it was a fully functioning prototype. It was manufactured in ABS using uh, Fortis 400s, uh, manufactured in several bits and joined together. So we're not limited by a build envelope. We know how to design parts using this process. It wasn't just the door and the door fitting in the orifice of the, of the race car. It was the head protection, it was the hinges, and it was a fully functioning prototype of every, every function of that door. Later down the stream, as a result of mitigating that risk, we were able to start our tooling manufacture for the real parts much, much earlier. So we were still investing in the design and keeping the design uh, released till the very, very last minute so that we knew that we had every opportunity to optimize that design in a very short period of time. But at the same time, we were able to release certain elements like composite tooling very early because we'd now proven with a, a, a plastic part, essentially, that we had manufactured in less than 48 hours, we had proven that it fitted the race car. We could now commit to thousands of pounds worth of tooling to make the carbon fiber parts with, with complete confidence. Instead of that part now having to arrive two or three weeks before the deadline, that part could arrive two or three days before the deadline because we knew it was right. You saw earlier in the previous slide a picture of uh, an ABS printed hinge. We actually 3D printed the real hinges on the race car as well. And we had to do that because there wasn't actually enough time to machine these uh, using traditional process. So this, we had initially designed it was going to be a, a CNC, five axis CNC machined uh, steel component. You can see it's fairly complex, it's quite elegant. It needed to be aerodynamic, it needed to be light, it needed to be stiff enough to pass the load tests imp impl um, implied on it by the FIA. But it also had to be manufactured quickly and cheaply. Motorsport is not a, uh, a, budget, a budgetless exercise. We all still have costs to work within. But the interesting part about the thing about this component was when we weighed up the options of CNC machining it in steel 
versus 3D printing it uh, using metal laser sintering, we couldn't even source the billet material in the same time that it would have taken us to print this part. In the end, by printing it by metal laser sintering in titanium, titanium being the most readily used available, materi readily used material in, in that process, we actually by default got a part that was cheaper, lighter, and stiffer than we could have made in our previous, previous processes. Now that doesn't work across the board in other sectors, but in this application where we were making two car sets of parts, this worked, and it gave us benefits. There's the component again fitted onto the race car. This is now uh, past its homologation tests. The team were able to compete in the whole season of racing ahead of them as a result. Incidentally, if that date had been missed, the consequences to the race team were that actually they wouldn't be able to race for a whole season. They'd have to wait another homologation deadline to, to compete. So it was time critical. It was also cost critical. Um, and it also was function critical in that we knew that the whole component had to work with, with zero risk. So the, the picture here shows the video that you saw earlier of the actual race car with the completed doors uh, in, the, in a, a driver extraction situation. So uh, you can see that in summary, it worked and, and, the, and the race team were very happy with the solution. So that's a, a very brief real world example of how we use additive manufacturing as a daily routine as part of our process. We didn't use it because uh, it was fun and it was cool and it was like an experiment this is what we do on a regular basis. Additive manufacturing is not a new process, it's not a new technology. The applications that we find for it and the applications and how we exploit those applications in different sectors, whether it be motorsport or performance cycling or in automotive or medical or rail, those are the exciting parts at the moment. And the software that's being uh, driven ahead of that, as you saw earlier with the Autodesk presentation, is really starting to make some of these things possible. And we're actually going to be able to start designing things that can now exploit the manufacturing processes that are there ahead of us in additive manufacturing. So I hope that was interesting. Thank you very much.